Hallelujah. And you know what? The emotional component of that is very real, but it's not where the substance is. When you walk out of here and you're faced with some of the same stuff that you walked in with, remember, it's beyond the emotion. It says, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life, even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't feel you, right? You can be seated. Man, that is just so important for us to remember. We, 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 God made us with emotions. He made us to, to laugh and to, and to cry, and, and He made us to sense His presence. He made us to cry out to Him. And sometimes we come into this room here, and it's just like we've, we've just shut everything else out, and, and we just come and we say, oh, man, I just feel your presence so strong in this place. And that quick, something can happen. Somebody can say something to you. Hopefully nobody in here. But it happens. We, we're all imperfect, right? Somebody says something, maybe they didn't even mean it that way, and right away you're like, well, that just turned that right around. But you see, what we have in Jesus is a foundation that goes a whole lot deeper than just the surface. When you're following Jesus, you're like Jesus said in the book of Matthew about the wise man who builds his house upon the sand, uh, on, on the rock, not upon the sand. We cannot build our lives upon the sand of fleeting emotions. But I thank God for the emotions. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to encourage you before I even get started with the message here to... Uh, Make a plan to come out tonight. Would you do that? We've been having a good, good number of folks, and uh, it's really not overly organized. Uh, we are going to do a couple songs tonight. Um, about five minutes before, I'll ask God to show me where to go in the message or the, the Bible, or maybe somebody else has a word. We pray for one another, and it's just really cool how it takes a life of its own. So I would encourage you. Don't get too tired this afternoon. Get your nap and come on back. <laughs> Last week, Easter Sunday, I just had a short little message, but I read two passages of Scripture relating to the hope that we have, relating to the power that is available to us. And it was appropriate because of Resurrection Sunday. And the first scripture was from Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. And to think that that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you if you're born again. Just... Can we just thank God for that? Yes. I mean, God loves us so much, He invested Himself in us. And the other scripture that speaks to that too from Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. I'm going to read that first sentence again, because it's my prayer too. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Very hard for us living in flesh and blood to imagine the place where God dwells. I mean, God is everywhere, but yet we think of God in His heaven, right? And that picture is about the best we can come up with. We see the, the way the light comes through, and we see the majesty of creation. And often, when we look at the majesty of creation, we can see the power of God. We have our Harvest Host guests that come and visit us. Uh, they're getting more regular now. We have an RVers, for those of you who don't know. RVers come, and they can plug in and get water, and we meet people, and uh, just a way to kind of bless some other folks, and they bless us in return. But so many of them say, what beautiful country this is. And if you grew up in farm country, you may not think anything about it, but you take a look sometime as if you're a tourist. Do that sometime. When you're coming down 81 in between 
your white knuckles being scared that you're going to get run over. When you're coming down 81, between here and Carlisle, just look at one farm right after the other. One, one, right after the other. And some of them are over 300 years old. Neat part of the country. And we have folks from different parts of the country, and they'll say, what beautiful country this is. And we can see God in creation. But I want you to understand more than just the the glories of His creation. I want you to understand the character and nature of God who loves us so much that He just went, we would say, overboard. He, He just went beyond anything that any of us could possibly say that we even remotely deserved. Because it's more than forgiveness. It's more than heaven when we die. It's more than missing hell, although all those things are wonderful. But it's the life that He intends for us to live now. Right? right? And there, there are a few things that frustrate me more when I see believers in Jesus Christ sitting on their hands. And I joked about sitting on the hands this morning. I'm not talking about that. I mean feeling so inept and feeling so unable to contribute anything to the kingdom of God because they just feel, oh, well, how could God use me? Meanwhile, from the very beginning, God has just given us everything. His desire is that he would have relationship with his creation. That heart of God has never changed. Why would God do this? Why would he invest so much in this? Why would he give us something this precious Something that we could never deserve or comprehend because it's his character and nature to do so. Because that's who God is. And God is is consistent. He's faithful. He never changes. He is good. Amen. God's most prized creation, mankind. On the other days of creation, he said, it's good. And when he created man, he said, this is very good. And in no time at all, man decided that he knew better. But in Genesis, at the time of creation, God spoke with mankind directly. God, because of his character and nature, started out from the very beginning going to greater lengths to provide ways for that that separation which he had no part in creating to be overcome. Amen. I agree. In Genesis, at the time of creation, God spoke with mankind. God interacted with them. God was with them. Adam and Eve, God walked with them every day. They learned from him. They experienced his love. They knew what it meant to be empowered by Him. And God put them in a garden, not just so they'd have a place to sit out on the deck after a long day's work. No, He put them in the garden because He provided everything they needed. This This whole blood, sweat, and toil thing is because of the fall. If we can think about what heaven's going to be like, no more sin, no more sickness, no more preaching, right? We're just going to praise Him around the throne. (laughs) <laughs> That's the way it was in the beginning. God's character and nature has not changed all through history. We read uh, the first time it's recorded that God spoke to His creation is in Genesis two sixteen and 17. Here's what it says. But the, but the Lord God warned him, meaning Adam, You may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. Now, this doesn't mean that this was the first time that God ever communicated with His creation, but it's the first instance that we have recorded in this first book of Moses. How did God speak? I don't know. But consider this for just a second. If the Son and the Holy Spirit were with God, preexistent, never created, always were. Our finite minds do not have a place to put that. And if Jesus is the living Word of God, well, I think maybe the Son has something to do with how Adam and Eve heard. Just imagine a communication so open, no hindrances, 
there had been no rebellion. It, it had to have been just like talking to a friend. Here, the first recorded time, what is it? It's a warning. God gave Adam a warning. Why? Was he trying to cramp Adam's style? Was he trying to put his thumb on him? Is it because he didn't want his creation to have good things? Not at all. <laughs> he created mankind in his image and likeness. And to create someone, to create a being in the image and likeness of God, that being had to have a choice. That being had to have free will because God of his own free will said, let there be light. Let there be. He spoke everything that was not in existence into existence. So if he's going to create someone in his image and likeness, he has to give him a choice. How could mankind have free will if he had no choice? How could mankind choose the good if he didn't know the evil? How could mankind choose to obey if he did not have the choice to disobey? So we see this first instance of God's desire to empower his creation. The very thing that Satan told Eve when he tempted her uh, to eat the forbidden fruit was that, that God didn't want them to be like God. And that was an outright lie. Genesis 3, Satan told Eve, you won't die if you eat this fruit. Your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God and no good from evil. Satan's half-truths, half-truths. His greatest strategy is in half-truths. Because you can take part of that and say, absolutely, that's exactly what happened. When they disobeyed, I don't know what the fruit was or if it was a fruit. That To me, it's not important. But they had a choice to make, and they chose poorly, right? So part of what the devil told her was true. Their eyes would be opened, and they would know good from evil. They were in this incredible state of ignorant bliss. Don't you wish sometimes you could enter that state? and just be totally ignorant of all the evil going on. <laughs> That's where they were. They, they trusted God for everything, and He spoke to them. And aside from their act of disobedience, the big lie that Satan wanted them to believe was that God didn't want them to be like Him. You know what? Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I know if you, if you grew up in a very legalistic church where you had the idea that God is just waiting for a chance to smite you, you're not going to like the fact that I said God wanted them to be like Him. But this is His character and nature doesn't mean that we become God. I know there's some pretty crazy theology out there, but no, no, it's not that we would ever be like, or that we'd ever be God. It's not like that. It's just that He wants us to be like Him, and to, to be like Him, He has to be willing to invest Himself in us in ways beyond, I guarantee you, ways beyond most churchgoers have ever imagined. God would have been righteous to wipe his creation off the face of the earth after they disobeyed. He could have concluded that, well, this was an experiment that didn't go well. But do you think God's ever been surprised? His foreknowledge is something that's just amazing. It's, it, you know, but in our way of thinking, you know, the independently minded creature, when they disobey, ah, that didn't work. <laughs> He did not abandon his plan. He persisted because of the very character and nature of God. His very character and nature is to love and to give and to empower. And friends, we are to live lives that are empowered by the very God who put up with us and has put up with our disobedience 
and has had to come back and forgive us again and again, who gave his very best, his son, to die for us, and for us to turn around and slap him in the face. His character and nature has not changed. We cannot think of God as a mere man. He's beyond that. He is perfect. He is love. And he wants the best for us. I mean, along with amazing physical and mental intricacies that he created this with, God created the potential in every human being to know power beyond the natural, to have unending growth. And his plan for every born-again believer today is that we never stop growing closer to him, Amen. that we never stop. Check off the box, hang on till heaven, not in the Bible, nowhere. He wants us to have a deeper understanding. I say often that he's crazy about you, and he cannot wait to whisper the secrets of heaven into your ear if we only choose to listen. And even with all that grace and love and patience, how many are grateful for the patience of God? <laughs> oh, I thank him for that first and foremost. Thank you for your patience with me. Amen. All part of God's character and nature. Even with all of that throughout history, mankind continued to go his and her own way because man thought he knew better. Might not say it out loud, but the actions speak louder than words. Do you know that any time we get out of walking in faith, we're in sin? Do you realize that? That every time we step out of walking in faith, it's sin. And we may never say it, but to, and I'm not saying that I don't do it too, but I'm saying that whenever we step out of faith, whenever we, we don't take what the Bible tells us that we can um, step into, it's sin. So you may not smoke and you may not chew and you may not go with girls who do. <laughs> but anytime you don't take God at His word, it's sin. And that's why without Jesus, we're helpless. So God went out of His way to prove His character and nature. First, He established judges and prophets. And he set apart people that had this special relationship with God, people that heard God's voice. They knew him intimately because God was with them. They walked with him every day. They learned from him. They experienced his love. They knew what it meant to be empowered by him. And it seemed like they were few and far between, but there were those special people. We read through the Old Testament. They had that special connection with God. And some of them, even, even when you take today in the New Covenant, some of the things that God enabled them to do blows our minds today, right? Even before Calvary and even before Pentecost. I mean, some of these prophets were weird dudes, you know? They would not go over well in our society today. And I believe there are prophets today. I know there are some who are self-proclaimed, especially with what's going to happen tomorrow. An eclipse, uh, people get carried away sometimes, but... There are true prophets today, and they're usually a little weird. They usually just come right out and say things that people don't know what to do with them. Later on, God gave the law through Moses. Moses, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. Exodus 33, 11 says, Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And through his faithful servant, Moses, God gave the law. And the law, the Ten Commandments, and all the other laws and requirements, and the sacrificial system, and all of this kind of stuff, that God had set apart his chosen people, Israel, even though they fought him at every step of the way. He cannot go back on his word. He still has his hand upon them today. He wants them to know his son, but he still has his hand upon them today. But the law was given as a litmus test for all human behaviors 
and interactions. And part of it was societal, right? There are just some things that you want to do as a society because you're considering the other person. So a lot of the things that we see in the law make sense today even for people who uh, don't believe in God. Our, our, our legal system in this country and in most countries has some foundation in the law of Moses because there's just certain things you don't do to other people. But the law was more than that. It pointed out sin, and it pointed out a perfect God and imperfect people. And the law was never intended to save. You could not be saved by keeping the law, but the law pointed out the seriousness of sin. The law of Moses was unable to save because of the weakness of our sinful nature. We find that in Romans 8.3. But we could not any longer be ignorant of what he expected from us. There was no longer ignorance, was no longer an excuse. The law was set down. This is what the holy God expects of his creation. And even with all of that, even with the will to choose good or evil, mankind chose evil almost every time. But God's character and nature had not changed. He persisted. He even allowed for kings in Israel against his better judgment because they were so jealous of the nations surrounding them who had long ago given up on God. And he allowed them to have kings. Most of them were rotten. A couple of them were good. David was a man after God's own heart. Josiah led sweeping reforms. But you read through 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. You read they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And there's more evil than there is right. But yet God's character and nature never changed. And God disciplined his children, but he never abandoned them. Though he had every right to. He had every right to. They they broke the covenant with him. He had every right, but he did not. He continued to invest himself into those who would look to him. He had can you imagine the level of disappointment in heaven? You know how when your kids, I remember when I was a kid and I'd get in trouble, my parents didn't beat me, but they said, Tim, we're very disappointed in you. And it was like, beat me, please. Because I did not want to hurt my parents. And I'm blessed to have grown up with parents like that. Imagine a heavenly father. And the, the, the disappointment and the pain he must have felt when his own children, who had everything going for him, turned on him. Wanted to be like another country. Wanted to, you know, like little kids. He continued to invest himself. So much rebellion on the part of God's prized creation, and still his character and nature never changed. And in the fullness of time, God came down. And the person of the Son became Jesus, born of a virgin, living a sinless life, and he did it in order to provide the opportunity for this relationship that had been broken by sin to be restored to once and for all break the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed is anyone who does not affirm and obey the terms of these instructions. It's referring to the law, right? And it says that all of the people said, Amen! And they didn't do it. Galatians 3, 13 says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse, pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it's written in the Scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus paid that price. No one else had his qualifications. And when this was all done, and after the finished work of the cross, God gave man a choice. And he said, I give you a choice between the way of faith and the way of the law. I'm going to give you a choice of the way of faith in what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, or the way of the law, trying to be good by ourselves. And there are people today in this society who just say, well, I'm a good person. Well, good people can go to hell. Because when you're trusting in your own goodness, it's not enough. It's just not enough. There's no amount of good we can do. 
The way of faith brings freedom and new life. The way of the law brings bondage and a curse. The way of faith allows God to come and live within us. Live within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. The way of the law rejects God and says, I'm okay. I'll do it my way. In Jesus' earthly ministry, the disciples were empowered. This, this is amazing to me. When he sent them out and gave them authority to do all these things, Luke 9, 1, 2 says, One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And I look at this and I say, how is this even possible? Before he even went to the cross, before the Holy Spirit was sent, how is this even possible? He hadn't yet sent the Holy Spirit to indwell and empower. But listen, God in the Son was with them. God was with them as another person, as, as a teacher to them, as their rabbi, as the one who they had witnessed do all of these miracles. And then God in the flesh said, now I authorize you to go and do this. Because God was with them. Because they walked with him every day. They learned from him. They experienced his love and they knew what it was to be empowered by him. And then after Jesus gave his perfect life on the cross, after defeating death, after rising from the grave, he again invested in those closest to him over a period of 40 days when he again walked the earth in this glorified body, this, this body that was, was visible, that looked different. We don't know exactly why, but he wasn't always recognized, but yet he bore the prince of his crucifixion. Yet, uh, locked doors were no barrier to him. He would appear, and this, this new type of being that almost today sounds like science fiction, he invested himself for 40 days. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine 40 days walking and talking, even eating with the resurrected Christ? And he reiterated his promise that he had made to them before. He said, listen, I'm going away. And it's good for you that I will because I'm going to send another comforter. He said, I'm going to send somebody else who's going to come alongside of you. Why? Because God's character and nature has never changed. He wants to invest himself in people that are willing to trust him and willing to follow him. On the very day of his resurrection, that first Easter evening, that first Sunday night church service, when Jesus appeared behind locked doors, his disciples were cowering in fear. We read something that happened. It's in John 20, verse 22. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So just as God had breathed into his creation called man, Adam, that's what Adam means, just as he breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul, once again, Jesus breathed upon his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus was giving them life. Never in creation, never since creation, had it been possible for God himself to inhabit a human being. Not because God didn't want to, but because sin made it impossible. The power of sin had been broken because of one who was not deserving of death had willingly accepted it once for all, once and done, finished work. Didn't stop there. God's desire to empower his prized creation had not changed in spite of years of disobedience and sin because God's character and nature is unchanging. He still desired to make his creation like himself. But there was a greater promise yet to come. Just before his ascension, Christ gave his disciples three wills. He said, you will receive the Holy Spirit. He said, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. How could he say you will? Because they had been 
walking with him in his earthly ministry. They had spent the last 40 days walking with this glorified version of Jesus. And they were committed to whatever it takes to having that fellowship with God that Jesus died for. Today, it's almost like we think Jesus said, well, you may receive power. But he said, you will. And that promise has not changed because God's character and nature has not changed. If his character and nature didn't change from creation to Jesus, how can we think that his character and nature has changed from Calvary to now? He wants us to be like him. He wants to empower us. He wants us to live way above what we think our pay grade is. There was a greater promise when he gave him these three wills, when he said, you will receive the Holy Spirit. When would this happen? Well, when the Holy Spirit had come upon them. He ascended. He told them, don't leave town. Hang out in Jerusalem because you're going to need everything you can get. He ascended. Think about it. The crucifixion, the ascension, 40 days. Um, some of the more liturgical churches, and I believe uh, some of the Mennonite and Amish celebrate Ascension Day. This year that's on April 9th. Because that, or May, um, May 9th, because that's 40 days after Easter. And then Pentecost is on May 19th this year, and sometimes we don't get into the liturgical calendar, but there are times where it's kind of good for us to follow it. Makes sense, because it keeps it in mind in a present-day reality of that period of time between his, his resurrection, between his ascension, and then the day of Pentecost. Penny means 50. Pentecost was an Old Testament uh, harvest festival. And God, true to his character and nature, did something mighty on that first New Testament Pentecost. You know, they waited in anticipation. They took God at His Word. They took Jesus at His Word when He said, don't leave town. And so they waited. What did they do? They got together for 10 days. I don't think they knew it was 10 days unless they were looking ahead to Pentecost, thinking, well, maybe that's when He's going to do it. But they didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know what it was going to look like. They just know they had to wait. And I think they were committed for the long haul. And they met together, and they prayed together, and they even did some business together that they needed to do. But they listened. And God, true to his character and nature, true to his desire to invest himself into his prized creation, and in keeping his promise to the disciples never to leave or forsake him, sent his Holy Spirit in might and in power um, beyond anything that anyone ever thought possible. Yet moving beyond that breathed upon them of John chapter 20. Now it's an infusing of heavenly power, so unprecedented that it forever changed the remembrance of that ancient harvest feast of Pentecost. Into the moment in time when mankind would enter this into a newness of relationship with the Father that was unmatched by anything that had ever happened previous to this time in history. And one once fearful disciples the ones that hid out, the ones that denied him, the ones that cowered in fear on that first Sunday night service behind locked doors for fear of what the religious leaders were going to do to them, they became world changers. Yes. Yes. Amen. Started off with just a handful, 120 in the upper room. Changed the world. Yes. Changed the world. A once oppressive religious zealot by the name of Saul would become Paul, taking the gospel to the world of the Gentiles. Book of Acts records what happened to ordinary people filled with His Holy Spirit. It overcame the greatest of odds because God was with them, because they walked with Him every day. Was Jesus there anymore? No, but the Holy Spirit wasn't just there. The Holy Spirit was in them, overflowing through them. They learned from the Holy Spirit. They experienced His love. They knew what it meant to be empowered by Him. Why? Because God's character and nature has never changed. And there can be no question that in the early days of the church, it was normative to expect a baptism in the Holy Spirit following salvation. 
You read accounts like it in Acts 2 and Acts 8 and Acts 9 and Acts 10 and Acts 11, Acts 19. There was something that happened after salvation. Believers yielded control to what God wanted to do in them. And men and women throughout history have experienced this. They would experience this empowering to the extent that they would give their lives in preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want a humbling experience, look through Fox's Book of Martyrs and look at what some of the early church leaders surrendered. You ask yourself, would anybody do that for a religion? Would anyone do that for an opinion? Would anyone do that for a preference? I don't think so. They were lit on fire with power of the Holy Spirit that God made available, that He wanted to make available from the very beginning because He has never changed His character and nature. And the blood of the martyr still cries out to us today with the message that not only does Jesus save, He wants to make us overcoming, empowered, gate of hell shaking world changers. Nothing has changed. So in light of this, how is it possible that in some cases church has been reduced to a building we sometimes go to with the witness of millions of spirit-filled believers who have gone before us? How could we make such silly excuses for inaction on our part by saying things like, well, God, if it be your will, please, we always need to be praying the will of God. But we can know the will of God in most circumstances because of His revealed will in the book that we call the Bible, confirmed by His Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that too many people sit back and say, well, it has to be His will. It's an excuse for laziness, an excuse for lethargy, and it's an excuse to not take God at His word, because after all, gee, can He really be trusted? God wants me to have more of His Spirit. Well, then He can give it to me. God wants you to have lunch today. He'll cram it down your throat. God wants me to walk in the miraculous. Well, He can lead me anytime He wants. God wants to heal my body. Well, He can do that if He wants to. Probably won't. What, what, What happened to the passion? What happened to the you will? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. You will walk in faith. Think about those early change, transformed disciples. In Acts chapter 3, remember the, the man who was lame from birth? Right? They didn't go up to the man lame from birth and say, God, if it be your will, be with this man. He already promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. And the authority of Christ, because of their relationship with Him, they said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And if you read through that story, you find He didn't just hobble up, He jumped. Folks, we are putting way too much on God for what He's already done. There's a finished work of the cross that we have to walk in. Do I understand it? Sure don't. Do I always, am I always successful at doing this? No, I'm not. Do I sometimes uh, get to thinking, well, gee whiz, what happens if it doesn't work? Yeah. Anybody with me on that? But if God's character and nature never changed from the beginning up and through what we have in the Word of God, what makes us think that since Acts 28 was concluded, that somehow He's changed? as if walking and expecting God's power in our lives is somehow presumptuous on our part. Think about this. 
Here's what, here's what you say when we refuse to walk in faith. I could never ask God to do what he already said he wants to do in and through me. Do we do that with salvation? Can you see your salvation? Do you look any different when you look in the mirror? I mean, you might be happier. I hope you are. Probably smile more. Probably sleep better at night. But that outward you hasn't really changed. We do it by faith, trusting that Jesus did everything for my salvation. What happens when we have to walk through life? What happens when we put one foot in front of the other and we back off? Because after all, I don't want to get out of his will. Huh? Walking in God's empowering does not dishonor him. It honors him. How can you claim to be a follower of Jesus and have a biblical worldview and dismiss the miraculous? But there are lots of places today, and it has nothing to do with denominational label. I've been to almost all of them in my time on the road. And there's, there's stagnant Christians everywhere. And they turn it around and blame it on maturity. Well, I've grown since then. Well, that's too bad. You need to be more like a child. Walk in the miraculous, that's what God is all about. Has following Jesus really become that boring? Has self become such an idol that we're satisfied with nice services and sterile meetings? Has faith become such a buzzword that we've forgotten that it's indeed the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? Faith is a noun. It's substance of what we can't see, of what we haven't reached, and what we haven't experienced. Faith is real. It's not wishful thinking. It's not pie in the sky. It's based on this. See, revival wrecks this way of thinking and believing and living. So we need revival, right? Right? That means all of us. You've heard me say it before. Pastor, what we need is revival. Go ahead. Go ahead. What are you waiting for? Knowing God's character and nature, you think he's going to say, no, don't get too excited now. Don't trust me. I wouldn't want you to do that. After all, I just spent 6,000 years trying to prove to you that I want you to take me up on my promises. We are seeing revival today. We're seeing it in a lot of places. I, I think I'm expecting it to grow into awakening. I think there are places around this world where we're in an, another great awakening. Do you know what? So much of it is up to us because God's already finished this work. We stand around waiting for God to do something, and he's already done it. He says, church, stand up, step out, walk in faith, trust me to do the miraculous. I'm going to keep preaching messages like this because I know that God's power has not diminished. I believe everything that I've said this morning. I believe that there is more potential empowering for each of us that, than any of us could ever dream of. And it's not for our glory, it's for His. Amen. I'm going to keep preaching messages like this because I know that God's power has not diminished, nor has His Holy Spirit taken a vacation. God still wants us to be more like Him. That's been His heart all along, created in His image with the free will to choose. And He still wants us to choose life. The supernatural is not just for the history books. The, the, the walking in the power of the Holy Spirit is not just for professional clergy or evangelists or those odd prophets you see once in a while. They're just a little weird. It's for every day, born again, Spirit-filled believers in Jesus Christ. The supernatural isn't for the history books. It's part of our book. Yes. And some people would call our book Acts 29. And if you don't understand that, you might want to open up the book of Acts and find out where it ends. I believe the book of Acts is still being written someday. And it might be very soon. Jesus is coming back for His church. His last effort 
to be with His called out assembly forever. And it's going to be restored paradise. Back to when it began, where there was no sin, no temptation, no sickness, no death, no hell, no grave for us who are redeemed. A culmination of history, the completion and the continuation at the same time of man's relationship with God, the restoration of all things, a new heaven and a new earth. You might say it's an end of the choice because there really won't be another choice. Because everything that has tempted us to go our own way will have been removed. It will be illegal (laughs) for the enemy to have any effect in the new heavens and the new earth. Because death, hell, and the grave will have been conquered forever by Jesus. You know, I think in some circles we've almost apologized for Pentecost. We're a Pentecostal people. We have our roots in the Pentecostal revivals of the early 20th century. And I know that we've, we've got a few flakes and nuts and, and a few excesses and all that kind of stuff, but don't ever let the excesses keep you from pursuing everything that God has for you. And I think sometimes we've apologized for Pentecost. I don't apologize for Pentecost. If there's ever been a time and a place that we need to come and say, God, I want you to pour all your spirit out on me, just like you did on that first Pentecost, your promise that we would receive, we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we would receive power, and we would be witnesses, believing that that is still possible today. We've explained away the miraculous because we don't see it as much. Well, guess what? That's not on God. And we have to be careful that we don't make it our good works either. It's a matter of how do we simply receive that which Jesus gave his life for us to lay hold of. In some cases, I guess we've made the miracles of God kind of our own possession when we go around and we boast and we say, well, I have the gift of, you, you have nothing. You have nothing beyond what God's allowed you to be used in, right? But it's time for the church to walk in the same expectation that the early church had, and that's walking in faith. We don't have to understand it all. But my goodness, we've got 66 books and 1,189 chapters plus the witness of the Holy Spirit in our life, plus each other to help us through this thing, right? Lone Ranger Christianity has become a thing. I'm glad for live streaming. We're doing it today for people that can't come, but I'm sorry. It's not the same as working together. Stay home and watch the show, or you can come and get engaged with people and sharpen one another and encourage one another. It's time for the church to walk in expectation. It's time to walk in the faith of our fathers and mothers who gave everything for Jesus. Amen. It's time to declare that the things that are clearly in the will of God and stop declaring the things that are clearly not the will of God. God is not going to make anybody sick. He's not going to strike anybody with cancer. It's a result of the fall and the fallen world in which we live. But God didn't give it to us. We do not have to be overwhelmed by the results of bad choices, whether they're our choices or people that lived a long time before us. Stop quenching the fire of God and claiming to be mature. Stop speaking, start speaking life instead of death, victory rather than defeat. Come before God, just willing to receive all that He's gone to great lengths for us to have. It's all accessed by faith. It's the same faith that saved you. It's the same faith that makes you be able to get up in the morning, brush your teeth, put on clothes, and head out the door. It's the same faith that sustains you, and it's the same faith that heals you. It's the same faith that will fill you with Holy Spirit power. And we have to cooperate with God. You know, Through the years, Melody and I have uh, done the fixer-upper lifestyle. We restored three very sad houses while living in them and working full-time at the same time. And uh, when we moved to Shippensburg, 
were getting to the end of our time in our 50s, and we went, yeah, no, we're done. But I have dreams to this day about projects that it was either, in my dream, it's either a house we lived in that had an extra floor that we didn't know about, <laughs> or a door into something that, oh, I didn't know this was here. And there seemed to always be a pressure in these dreams that, got to get this done, got to get this done. And for years I thought, well, you know what that is, is usually we finished working on the house right when we decided to sell it. <laughs> you know, if any of you know what that's like, there's always unfinished edges, you know, and it's just never have time. So you're working to finish the house so you can get it on the market. But you know what? The longer I, the longer I live and I still have these dreams, I believe God is saying something else about that. I believe that hidden potential in those houses isn't in a house, but it's in me. Amen. And I'm not the only one. It's you too, but it's my dream, right? So that God is telling me that the hidden potential is in me, and that hidden potential has nothing to do with houses. I mean, I hope I'm done rehabbing houses. You never know. I'm still healthy, but the hidden potential has to do with me. How about you? How about you? Is there, is there a floor to the house that you didn't know about? Is there something that, that God wants to do in you, and you have already said, well, I'm done rehabbing houses, but God's not done rehabbing you. But you know what? When you come to a point where you finally are willing to understand that His character and nature has not changed, and that He wants you to become more like Him, and that it makes His day when you take Him at His word. You, you think it, you think it, 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 we act like He's going to be you know, ready to hit us with a lightning bolt if we step out too far. Well, if you're in Christ and you know what He has willed for your life, whenever you take steps of faith, I think God celebrates. Oh, yes. I don't understand how, that, how all that looks, but someday I'll have a renewed mind and a renewed body and I'll be able to understand all that. But here's something you got to do. You got to remember, if you're going to live your potential in Christ, you got to be willing to die to yourself. Yes. Yes. And I'm not just talking about salvation. Because you can be saved on your way to heaven and still have your hands on everything. Yes. And, and think, well, I would do that, but then I couldn't do this. Well, who says you need to do this? Yes. Right? Galatians 2.20, right? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because I live. I turned it around. That was paraphrased. <laughs> We're crucified. We have to crucify the flesh. Because the flesh wants what the flesh wants. When the flesh wants it. And the idea that we think the flesh is going to change just because we said a sinner's prayer is an exercise in futility. You have to die to yourself in order to live for Him. And it starts with salvation. That's where it all begins. And you've heard a lot of that this morning. You've heard a lot of that this morning. But I know that I went to church every Sunday, and anytime anything else was happening, our family was there. My mom taught Sunday school and sang in the choir and led the youth choir and led children's choir and played piano and did all these things because her father was a pastor. So I have a legacy, my grandfather, my parents. I met my wife in church. My son met his wife in church. We have a lot of church in the legacy. But I know that I was 18 years old and out of the church building before I fully surrendered my life to Jesus. And I knew the truth. I never once doubted God's love for me. And that perhaps could be that I had a good example for an earthly father. I know a lot of people didn't have that. I never doubted God's love for me. I, I even knew I was called to ministry before I was born again. I knew it. And I knew that I was still hanging on to some things. One night when I was 18 years old, laying in my bed, I, I said enough. 
And I said, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you no matter what. And everything's been perfect since then. Yeah, you know better. But in all the years since that happened, I'm going to tell you something. He has shown himself faithful. He has opened up more to me than I'd ever dreamt possible. He has allowed me to walk in areas of ministry. And and even if you understand how I mean the word influence, I don't mean for me. I mean kingdom influence. That he It's just a favor of God. That he's just said, here, go do this. And I went, okay. And I did. Not everything in life was that easy. I've never made a lot of money. I've never been famous. I've never, you know, all those kind of things that the world looks at. But he has granted me favor in ministry. And I know that there's a whole unfinished floor yet for me to walk into. Because I do not doubt his character and nature. That has remained unchanged since he first spoke the world into existence. Don't stop. Don't stop. Take him at his word. If there are things you don't understand, join the club. If you said, I, I'm, you don't know what I'm facing. I'm facing this. Well, you don't know what I've faced. I don't talk about it a lot because it's done. Just walk, put one foot in front of the other. I've been given a really bad physical diagnosis. Finished work. Finished work. We don't have to beg God for something He's already provided. Do we always see that happen? Nope. We don't. Part of that I don't understand because we can't make our healing about our own will or about our own self-righteousness because then we are not crucifying the flesh. But I'm convinced that there's so much more to the things that we struggle over that we simply access by faith. And each one of you here has to deal with that with God on your own. There's not a list of things to do. There's not a list of things not to do beyond seek God. Understand His will. And when you're convinced of His will in a certain area, you walk expecting that He is going to keep His promise. I want to encourage you this morning. You can stay where you're at, or you can come to an altar of prayer. But I'm going to encourage you to seek God. Let's just take some time, and let's just enjoy the beautiful piano playing as Faye comes up. Let's just take some time, and let's say, I'm going to purpose to go after you, God. I'm going to purpose to understand more what you have created me for. I'm going to let your spirit tell me you're not done. You have not reached the pinnacle of everything that there is. There's unfinished rooms. There's a whole floor waiting for you. And I want you to dream. I want you to dream God-sized dreams for God-sized glory. As we come and we say, my own choices, my own will, the things that I put so much value in, Father, I just hold them up and I give them to you. He may not take them from you, but a willingness to let go of our own plans and our own priorities and what we think we have to do and what we think we can't do. You just take all that and you give it to him and he may leave some of that in your hand. But we have to constantly come to him saying, your will, Lord, I want to follow your will. Folks, there is so much that is waiting for us to simply walk into. There is so much that he has for this church. There is so much that he has for each person in this church for his honor and for his glory. If we say, I don't understand it, but yes. It doesn't make any sense to me right now, but yes, and we trust Him.